This is a glorified fish scale. You can always just buy a bathroom scale, but a force meter is an official bathroom scale. Right? It's like a fish scale, right? That's a force meter. It's, it's just weight. But this one can measure it to like the tenth of a newton. So that's a little bit more finesse. If you really want to know how hard to push a button before it pops, you use a force meter. And then having those on your belt like, makes you look cool. You're like, check it out. And you like, hook it up to stuff like, that took exactly 10 pounds. <laughs> and you impress engineers with that. Because like, what? How'd you know that? Force meter. Right? Have we ever done that? I, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I, I walk, uh, no, I mean, it's funny because, like, I remember going to the uh, assembly factories and we were to Ford Explorer plant, and, like, people who had some these were like, where'd you find your force meter? Like, it's like a conversation. <laughs> like, force meter, man. Like, yeah, One pocket has a pendulum screwdriver. <laughs> 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 All right, so, the more, and the only other thing I think that, as an engineer, it would be really useful to have, you must have, if you're doing any double E stuff, you must have a multimeter, multimeter, multimeter. That measures voltage, current, and resistance. And a lot of them have something called a thermocouple built into them. These things are like 40 bucks at fries and less. I've seen $17 ones at Home Depot. They usually have something called a thermocouple. A thermocouple means two probes that can actually measure the difference in temperature. So if you don't know your K value of the material, but you used it to make like a pot or something, you can measure the outside of the pot, the inside of the pot, and you know the thickness of the pot. So you can calculate the K value based off of a thermocouple. And many multimeters now have a thermocouple built right into them. Where you can, there are two probes, and you just stick them in, and they're glorified thermometers. So you can find the surface temperature of anything. And again, as designers who know products, these are really helpful to use. Those things I think are the most useful. This one, this one, and this one. This is a thermocouple, which is now built into multimeters now. Uh, this is a colorimeter, which again, you're not doing paint for like couches, you don't care about. And if you're not building engines, you don't need a filler gauge. And if you're not making windmills, you don't need this, which is a fluid dynamometer, which basically shows how much wind is coming through something. It's also called a pitot tube. OK, last slide. There are a lot of tools engineers know how to use to help analyze stuff. Most of the stuff you won't care about. The only thing that, just when you hear it, I'm going to explain what they are. House of quality is a way for them to organize what's important about a product and rank it using the Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> so what they do is what's important, how it's done, and a sensitivity matrix. They call that the house of quality. And all they do is map them against each other like a giant tic-tac-toe board and find out which one's the most important. So that's what house of quality is. Evaluation matrix and more charts are another way for them to generate ideas. Yeah. Design for assembly, design for manufacture, is at what order do the parts come in? So if you make something, right? Like if I make this coffee cup from three separate parts, design for assembly just means grab pot, cup, slide this in, rotate lid over, install. That's design for assembly. Here's the thing though, every flip, every motion you make increases the time to build it. And when you're making 72 Ford Explorers an hour, Every half a second counts. So an engineer does get paid a lot of money to really think about, well, did I have to flip the stupid lid over? Can something just come down from the ground and just drop it on there? That'll save you a quarter of a second. That's designed for assembly and designed for manufacturing. That's what they do. That's what they do. They're, they're optimizing the build of it. Especially if you know you got to make 10,000 of something. And you need it tomorrow, right? Whatever, right? That's what designed for assembly is. Every extra orientation, flip, or new part that gets introduced, every time you make a worker turn something, it's extra time and therefore labor cost. So you have to think about what's the most optimal way of doing that. If you look at the Apple Mac that Andrew's typing on, it's all built upside down. Flip it over, Andrew. It's all assembled that way. Close it real fast, I'm sorry. It's all assembled like that. The cover comes on the last with the screws. So a block of aluminum gets CNC'd out, they've dropped everything in from the top, the cover comes down, 12 screws, that's how it's assembled, right? It's not assembled the way it's perceived. Um, finite element analysis and failure modes and effects analysis talk about strength. So is always a way to stress and strain? This is a bike frame, and it's just color-coded. Where are the high stresses? Where it's red. That's finite element analysis. So if you ever want an engineer to tell you, where are my weak spots? They can show you the product and go, this is where it's going to break first, where it's red, because that's where it has the highest stress. 
highest pressure in the metal. So that's FEA. Failure modes and effects analysis is just giving you recommendations. Based on this FEA, tell me where it will break first. If it breaks first, if it breaks here, you fall off the bike. If it breaks here, your chain falls off. But you're still riding, right? And you can still break. So failure modes and effects analysis is an engineer giving you a recommendation that if something breaks, what's the easiest way for it to break and not hurt anybody? They will give you a recommendation. That's what an FEA is. CFD and deterministic design, computational fluid dynamics is just a race car, laminar or turbulent flow. And again, if you're not making sailplanes and airplanes, you probably don't care. That's it. Any questions? I know it's a lot of information, but I've already uploaded this lecture to you to the T Square. So you can pick up any of the stuff that you want to read. Like, any questions about this stuff? Yeah. So you're talking about like the assembly steps. For something like this, would you have a specific assembly for the components within the computer and then have that just drop into the assembly for the computer? A lot of times that is the case. Okay. So um, in factories, they sub-assembly first. So when you build a Ford Explorer, for example, the instrument panel comes in completely built from another factory that's right next door. So if, if Tower Automotive owns the instrument panel, or Visteon Automotive does the instrument panel, they'll ship it as a whole sub-assembly. And then the, again, the design for assembly engineers, like that comes in all pre-built, and we just slot it in the car. But the final assembly plan is where the car gets built from all its various parts. Yeah, because you don't want to build the headlight all by itself. Bulb, reflector, glass, wire. Like, you want that just to come in as one part, or what they call a sub-assembly. And when you all do this in SOLIDWORKS, you'll be making assemblies. Other question, great question. Any other questions? I know it's like long and boring. Let's hope we made that engineering fun. That's pretty much five, four or five years of engineering knowledge. So now you don't really need to take engineering if you don't really want to. Um, but if, you are, if you're super interested in the math, engineering is not harder than algebra. There's very little calculus in it at all. The only calculus is dx dt is, is velocity, dv dt is acceleration. And that's the only calculus you need to know. All the equations I showed you are basic algebra. So as long as you know the equations, you can find any of the material properties that you want using algebra, right? I mean, the calculus is only when you want to do something really crazy, like I've made paint, and I dropped it in a column of water that was stirring, and I want to see how much the paint circles around in like a vortex. Then you need calculus. But for the most part, these types of things, nah, you don't need it. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Okay, now it's Freebie Studio, so y'all have 40 minutes just to do nothing, I guess. <laughs>